It was sunset, almost, almost dark, red sky. And in a wood of lodgepole pines, a dark wood, I saw a grizzly bear. Well, I got my gun to my shoulder, and I expect my face was pretty pale, Kermit. <laughs> what, Ethel? Yes, yes, almost as white as your nightgown. <laughs> and I looked over the barrel, and the barrel was steady, so I shot him with my Winchester, and I wounded him. What, Ethel? No, no, I didn't kill him yet. I just wounded him, and I made him very, very angry. What, Ethel? Yes, at me. Now, I knew I couldn't leave him because he was wounded. Yes, and because he was angry, and because it was growing dark, and I knew that he would follow me, Archie, like this. <laughs> and Ted, his footprints were like yours, big and bare and pigeon-toed. What, Ethel? Yes, and dirty, like yours, Ted. What, oh, Ted, Ted, Ted. All right. So, I followed him into the thicket. But now, I couldn't see him. I couldn't see him. Was he gone, Archie? You hope so? <laughs> Ethel? Uh-huh. <laughs> Ted? Not gone. Kermit? He was hiding. Yes, Kermit. He was hiding. And now I heard crackling like twigs breaking and rustling like leaves moving. And suddenly there he was, right there in front of me and coming at me like a great gray black tornado cloud, smashing pine branches and throwing them aside like, like, like boxes of toothpicks. Well, I got my gun to my shoulder and I looked over the sight and oh, 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 he was coming so fast and his head was shaking from side to side, I couldn't get my, my sight onto his brain pan. What, Ethel? Yes, yes, his head. So I shot, bang and bang, both barrels, and then I jumped to one side. Yes, Kermit, yes, to get out of the smoke. But there he was, right in front of me, up on his hind legs, all nine feet of him, as tall as each of you children stacked one on top of each other's other shoulders. And with his giant paw, he tried to swipe me with his claws that were as long and sharp and, and dirty as, as, as your fingernails, Ted. And just as he did, he fell, and he was dead. Ethel, don't cry. <laughs> Archie, don't cry. No, 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 Papa's not dead. No, no, the bear was dead. Papa's alive, you see? Ted, don't laugh. It was a very long night. And the next morning, we moved out to take a red-tiled house at the top of the hill which turned out to be the Spaniards' firing bunker from which they could shoot straight down at us as we climbed the hill toward open ground. I rode back and forth in front of my men who were lying in the deep grass. I wanted them to be able to see me. They were dismounted cavalry. I was the only man on horseback. And the Spaniards rained fire down upon us from their modern Mauser rifles. I remember the bullets as they went past sounded like pieces of silk being ripped. My men were armed only with short-range carbines. And we were being killed left and right. It seemed silly to stay where we were, so I moved the Rough Riders up through to the very front of the line, through a regular army unit that was pinned down by the Spanish fire. Why won't you charge? We have no orders. Well, I'll give the order. Well, who are you? My name is Theodore. Never mind, sir. Please, just let my men pass through. Thank you. Charge. Richard Harding Davis, the Hearst correspondent, was with us, and he then described the taking of San Juan Hill for his newspaper. They had no glittering bayonets. They were not massed in regular array. The few men in advance crept up a steep, sunny slope, the top of which roared and flashed with flame. The men kept their rifles pressed against their breasts and moved forward with difficulty as though wading waist-high in water. It was 
much more wonderful than any swinging charge could have been. They walked to greet death, many sinking suddenly, pitching forward to disappear into the high grass. But the others, the others waded on stubbornly, stubbornly, forming a thin blue line that kept creeping higher and higher up the hill, inevitable as the rising tide.